A healthy diet can help prevent many diseases, colon cancer included. On this week's Health Talk, Dr. Kirsten Pritchard will provide important information to assist you in keeping your colon healthy and cancer free. So don't go away, we're up next. Hello, I'm Dr. Eric Mazur. Today our topic is colon health. Joining me is Dr. Kirsten Pritchard. She's a general surgeon with New Milford Hospital. Kirsten, thank you for joining me. Thanks for joining us on Health Talk. Thank you for inviting me. Well, to start off, a female surgeon, we don't have that many female surgeons on, on the set. How did you decide to get into surgery? I did, I'm, I'm ambushing you with this question, and I'm sorry. <laughs> but what made you decide to go That's into surgery? Okay. I, uh, I really thought I was going to be a pediatrician when I decided on medical school. And in fact, I applied to the school that would take me in that track until we did our third year rotations. And then my third rotation was uh, surgery and I was hooked. It helped that my first surgery that I was a part of was a pediatric surgery, but it just took me from there and I never looked back. But you're a general surgeon now. You're not even, a, I should say not even, but I mean, you're not a pediatric surgeon. You've really gone the whole way. And that's because during training, you're exposed to every part of surgery. And I never could settle on absolutely just one. I really loved it all. And so general gave me the opportunity to practice in many ways. Well, and I know that the colon, uh, to, to make a segue, the colon is part of general surgery. Yes. Uh, so tell us a little about colon health. Like we, a lot of people, there's a lot of stuff thrown around. Uh, now that I'm retired, I see on the internet all the time about detoxing and all this stuff. What is, it? What, what is the way to colon health? What is colon health? So I think we have to think about, and as a surgeon, usually think about anatomy first. So the colon is the last stop. And so when you think about the whole digestive tract, you swallow into your stomach, then there's 22 feet of small intestine until you get to the colon, and then there's about five and a half feet of colon. By the time the colon is reached, the stool is from liquid to solid. And the colon's real only job is to remove the liquid to keep the solid is what you expel. And so colon health really number one, two, and three starts with good hydration. And so one thing that I offer to my patients mostly is drink more water because that's what the colon's job is to give the water back to the system. And what, what would be some of the symptoms of of not drinking enough water, does that help? Is that part of constipation? Correct, and so oftentimes not going regularly, and regular is different for everyone. Now but that's an important point, and I've made that with my own patients. Yes. What is normal? Right, so normal is what is normal for you or me or our patients. And so basically that is whatever you feel comfortable with. Some people it's every day, some people it's every other day. As long as there's not a lot of straining and bloating and pain, Generally, whatever's normal for you. So if you go feels every other good. day, but you don't feel bloated, you don't feel crampy, and it just is comfortable, that's okay. Correct, and you don't have to spend a lot of time on the toilet, reading the paper, waiting to go. Before we leave the toilet, a couple of questions. I have read recently that squatting is a better way to poo than to actually sit on the toilet. Is that really true? So there is an anatomical change that uh, develops when you lift your knees up. And it is something that when, if you watch young, young folks and your kids uh, going, standing on their tiptoes, it does change the um, uh, anatomy of the rectum that actually gives it a bit of a straighter shot. So it may, you may have to push a little bit less to clear yourself out. Correct. And. Uh, the, the other interesting article that I just read, and maybe you can speak to this as a woman, you may have seen this in the New York Times, women poo get over it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. But, but apparently women have, which I was really unaware of, but apparently women are very self-conscious about this and it really could be a problem. Well, again, if you go back to the, the A, B, and C of eating well and hydrating, it's not a problem, but I think it's more, um, a focus on if you're not going as specifically like someone says you should go, there must be a problem. And then that's where all the detox and the cleansing comes from. Now, in terms of normal healthy bowel habits, uh, I've noticed for myself, and I think I've read as well, that oftentimes I know that eating can stimulate the colon 
and uh, oftentimes after breakfast is a good, is a normal time, and yet that's a, a, also a difficult time for a lot of people because usually rushing to get out of the house. Exactly. Can you say anything about that? So it's again, it's it's a pattern we get into, and and what you refer to is called the gastrocolic or the stomach to the colon reflex, where when you fill and stretch the stomach, the hormones start going and motility starts going. So that's not the food, and for people at home, that's not the food rushing through you. Correct. As you said, it's a reflex from the stomach to the colon that stimulates the colon to evacuate. Exactly, and so most people need a specific amount of time if they eat the same thing every day. And so oftentimes I'll hear in my practice, boy, everything was great until I went on vacation. And then I started eating rich foods, staying out later, drinking things that may not hydrate me as well, and now I'm having trouble going. And so it's routine, and again, it's predictability in terms of your schedule in the morning, how easy or difficult it is to go. Now, how about diet? How what about are the, what is the, we hear a lot about fiber. Uh, tell us about all that. So, uh, the recommendations are that we get 25 grams of fiber a day. And as a uh, description, if you ate an apple, the skin, the seeds, and even the core, but not the stem, that's just purposeless, that gives you about five grams. And so as you start to look at the produce and read the boxes, you start to get a gauge of how much you should be eating. For people who have conditions such as diverticulosis or tend towards constipation, they usually have to ingest more fiber and that's where the supplements come in. So what are some of the easy sources of fiber that people should be eating? So basically anything that's fresh and anything that is grown, if it can be locally, it's really helpful, whether it's potatoes with the skin on, your fruits with the skin on, if they're such as apples and pears. Um, there also have been uh, uh, increased um, additives to things we eat, such as brown rice and grains. So those are good mm -hmm. places to start. So sometimes I've read that the, the brown rice rather than the white rice, uh, the whole wheat bread rather than the white bread leaves more fiber behind. It, okay. Is that a lot? How many grams with, uh, I know I only, only eat whole wheat bread and uh, does it, how much difference does that make in a day? I have no idea. It depends. I mean, when you think about people eating bread, basically maybe you have some toast in the morning, maybe you have a sandwich, but people usually aren't eating, I don't think, three doses of bread each meal. Mm -hmm. So it, you ta think about the bread, if you have a choice to use something that has more fiber in it, whether it's bread or your cereal, then that gives you that extra boost as opposed to just having, if you have a choice, choose white versus not mm -hmm. white. It's, it, it's really and just- And why is fiber good? So Explain fiber, uh, it's uh, another uh, anatomic. Uh, fiber goes in and comes out in the same form. It does not digest. And so what it does and the way it works, it, as it moves through your system, it collects water from your system. And by the time it hits the colon, it really blows up like a sponge. And the way fiber helps your colon work is as the fiber is bigger and bulkier, the colon actually has to contract to move it along. And that's when the colon gets the idea that, hey, I've got a job to do, as opposed to just having your food sit there and not move, and that's constipation. So fiber is good for preventing constipation or helping constipate. Is it good for other things too? So it's healthy in terms of adding fiber to your diet as a colon cancer prevention. And so there's another benefit. Not only does your colon work better, but it actually can prevent cancer in the beginning. Now, I, I do remember when I was in medical school, which was many, many years ago, a very famous physician, Dr. Dennis Burkett, of Burkitt's lymphoma phase wow. fame spoke to us uh, and he was very funny. I remember this specifically and he was an early advocate of uh, high fiber diets and he had worked in Africa with Burkitt's lymphoma but he had also uh, was interested in the large volume stools that Africans had <laughs> because that they uh, because they ate so much fruits and vegetables and, and uh, fiber and I, he, he, he compared African stool, and he showed pictures of this, compared to British stool, which are the little pebbles in the, uh, in the toilet. And, and ever since then, I've been uh, uh, aware of this, 
And I, but I, I can't talk about fiber without thinking of that specific lecture. But then the little pebbles, and people do have them, that actually does mean there's probably not enough fiber in the diet because you, the colon is squeezing and squeezing and squeezing, and you're left with those, correct? Correct. Not only that, but now we talk about things that may be left behind. And so sometimes when we do colonoscopy or even do imaging studies, we see pills that are left behind. We don't know how long they've been there or something someone ate that did not digest or even pass. So now you know if your colon isn't moving correctly, perhaps you're leaving things behind, whether it's a toxin or even a foreign body. And, and I know people have even talked about if you're not evacuating as regularly, that we know there are carcinogens in the stool, that's just normal, but you're being exposed longer to them. Yes. So, uh, Anything else in the diet we should be doing? It's, it, we do, it's interesting, and I, I do hate to editorialize, but uh, maybe I don't hate to do it, but <laughs> we keep coming back to the same things in terms of general health, We're about not smoking and eating a vegetable diet that's probably uh, calorie controlled and not too much red meat, but what other things should we be doing to keep our colons healthy? Oh, and say, when should we think about taking supplements, fiber Excellent. supplements? So uh, I, in my practice, like to tell my patients if you can ingest your fiber, your body was made to chew and swallow and drink the water that makes the fiber go through your system. And unlike many years ago when we only ate maybe one big meal a day because that's the only thing we had to eat, the body's really meant to keep digesting. And so when we go to fiber supplements, if you take one pill or one wafer once a day, it's sending that big bolus of fiber through your system. And that's not really the way the system was made to function. Whereas if you take something several times a day, whether it's with a meal, between meals, uh, then your body gets used to that constant flow of the, of the fiber. And so supplements, I say, they're important if you find you can't get to that 25 grams, maybe the food you're exposed to or that you can buy, but supplements can be expensive. So I mm. always say if you can get it through your diet, you have to eat anyway, eat it first. So the, how do patients know how much fiber they're getting? It, is it listed, I didn't even know, is it listed on bread? Or, uh, yes. Or can you look it up, I guess you can look it up on Google. But. You, you certainly can, and again, once you go through that calculator in your mind that you need 25 grams, and it's, it's a slow marathon, you can't just walk out and eat 25 grams in one day, you have to build up to it. And so as you start to read your labels, whether it's your granola bar or your bread, um, we even add fiber to things that you wouldn't think, like yogurt, um, mm -hmm. so that you look at the, the amount that you see on each label and then you start to add it up. But you can find it easily on the, on the web and um, usually when you go to somebody who does colonoscopy or, or uh, talks about the colon with you, we have a nice long list of things to eat. So eating a lot of fiber, um Staying well hydrated, these are two sort of fundamental aspects of colon health. We only got a couple of minutes left, but maybe we should say something about colon cancer yes. and screening because that is a, maybe the biggest killer of men and women now together, or maybe lung cancer, but it's up there in the top three, I know. Yes, as of uh, the 2011 data, which is somewhat older, it was the second leading uh, cause of cancer death uh, after lung cancer. And so the recommendations now are uh, for someone who has no risk factors or low risk factors, so a family member with colon cancer, uh, usually a first degree relative or a grandparent, a mm. second degree relative, you should start at age 50 with the colon screening and the recommendation is a colonoscopy. And if you do have a family member or a higher risk, you can back it down to as early as 40. Yeah. Some of the genetic syndromes uh, where colon cancers can actually be found in teenagers, we start in the early teens. I've heard it recommending 10 years earlier than your youngest age where your relative had the can the, your first degree relative had the cancer. Yes. But it, yeah, and this is, colon cancer, it's terrible to be seen, to see people dying of it because we know that it develops sequentially in the vast majority of cases. So it, it's largely a preventable death. Do you want to say a couple words about polyps and cancer? Again, we have only a few seconds left. But. Right, so uh, every colon cancer begins in a polyp. Not every polyp will be a colon cancer, and that's why colonoscopy is really the only test that can identify and remove the polyps and therefore prevent the future colon cancer. There are, I know, a number of other tests that detect blood or genetic changes. Uh, they're not as effective as, I mean, they're better than nothing. I don't want to discourage people from doing those, 
but right. they're not as effective as colonoscopy. And at least they can direct you and say, okay, if you were on the fence about it, now if that test is positive, you really should pursue have it. To, unfortunately, we run out of time. I want to thank my guest, Dr. Kirsten Pritchard, for coming on Health Talk today, and thank you for watching. Remember to share your questions and comments. Please call Community Relations at New Vance Health, 203-852-2250. We want to hear from you and hear your thoughts. So we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. My days were spent playing basketball every chance I could. When I was six, my dream was to make it to the NBA. When I was six, my mom had a stroke. I'm Paul George, and I want you to learn the signs of a stroke fast. F-A-S-T. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. Because the sooner they get to the hospital, the sooner they'll get treatment. And that can make a remarkable difference in their recovery. Protect the ones you love. Spot a stroke, F-A-S-T, fast. If you have hemorrhoids, you're not alone. Millions of Americans suffer from hemorrhoids, a very common condition. Embarrassing and uncomfortable as well. On this week's Health Talk, we're going to discuss the causes, symptoms, and the treatments that can help alleviate this annoying problem. So stay tuned, we're up next. Hello, I'm Dr. Eric Mazur. Today our topic is the common and annoying problem of hemorrhoids. We'll discuss the causes, symptoms, and treatments with my guest, Dr. Kirsten Pritchard. She's a general surgeon at New Milford Hospital. Welcome to Health Talk, Kirsten. Thank you for having me. So you get to talk about something that we all suffer with and nobody wants to talk about too much, <laughs> hemorrhoids. What, what are they really? I suspect a lot of people, they, everybody's heard of them. I suspect a lot of people don't really even know what they are. It's true. And so the first thing to know is hemorrhoids are normal anatomy. Everybody's got hemorrhoids. And they're actually blood vessels. And so it depends on where they are and what they're doing to you that actually makes you come talk to me. So internal hemorrhoids, just as it sounds, those are blood vessels that live on the inside of the rectum. They're covered by the lining of the rectum. And you can't normally touch or feel them or even know they're there. When they cause trouble, they tend to bleed. They tend to protrude but where they're located, they have no sensation. And so that's the most common reason somebody would come to their doctor with painless rectal bleeding. I sat on the toilet, I looked in, and there was all this blood, but I never felt it. Now anything. that can be very scary, and it can also, rectal bleeding can be a sign of colon cancer. So Correct. I'm sure you should always have rectal bleeding evaluated. But Correct. there are some things that we as doctors use to differentiate cancer bleeding from uh, hemorrhoidal bleeding. Do you want to say a few words about that? Sure. I don't want people not to see their doctor if they're having rectal bleeding. Absolutely. So I want to make clear of that. And so rectal bleeding is always a concern. That being said, usually hemorrhoidal rectal bleeding occurs during or after a bowel movement. And if you're looking at the stool, the, the blood would actually be on the outside of the stool. Sometimes it's just blood in the toilet. Typically, there's no bleeding between bowel movements. So staining on the underwear or bleeding between bowel movements, that still can be hemorrhoidal, but that also can be more of a concern. So uh, don't be terrified, but do, do have it checked if you notice rectal bleeding. And keep looking. It's not something that you cover your eyes and don't look again, yeah. you look. Some people will say it's just when they wipe with toilet paper, and that usually, again, is sig signifies internal hemorrhoids. Actually, bleeding. you said something that's interesting. I, 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 you should look at your stools, shouldn't it's you? It's true. It's true. <laughs> it's a way to, to check yourself out. I, I, I didn't realize, I, I do, and I guess it's just a habit, but uh, I've, I've learned there are people that don't look at their stools. Yes, that's very common.
Yep. So, so that's a lesson people can take home from it. Look at your stool and see what's normal for you. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So tell us more about hemorrhoids. So that's the internal hemorrhoids. And again, painless. And that's what allows us, and we can talk more about how to treat them, but with internal hemorrhoids, we can do a lot of noxious things. We can put rubber bands on them. We can burn them. We can inject them. External hemorrhoids, just as it sounds like, they live on the outside. And so typically, you don't know they're there, but they're blood vessels that are covered by skin. And typically, they cause no trouble. But when they do, they, the blood vessel swells underneath the skin. And just like wherever you have skin on your body, you have sensation. And so some folks will say there's itching, there's burning. In the most extreme case, when the blood flows into the blood vessel and clots, that's when you reach back there and, oh, who put a walnut back there? That's a large thrombosed external hemorrhoid. That's my patient who's standing in my waiting room, and I know exactly. I always tell the <laughs> medical students, this is how you diagnose them. They're standing, they're in pain, and usually that's something we can treat right in the office. So what is the treatment in the office for a thrombosed hemorrhoid? It, it, again, they could be very painful, as you said. They really are. Uh, you let me convince you that I'm going to put Novocaine right where it hurts. But once the Novocaine takes effect, which only takes a few seconds, we make an incision and actually excise the stretched skin and the blood clot underneath. And the feeling of relief is instantaneous. I remember actually doing that as a, a student or a resident. I don't remember what, but it, yeah. it was very interesting to deliver the clot. It is, and you get all excited about it. <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> so wh what causes these problems with hemorrhoids? Excellent question. So anything that puts pressure, so now going back to these are blood vessels, and just like when your blood pressure rises, your face gets red, think about it with your backside too. When pressure rises, people who sit for a long time, drive trucks, sit on the toilet for a long time looking at the phone or reading a book or something, putting that pressure there makes the blood flow into these blood vessels, they swell, and in the case of the internal hemorrhoids, as the stool passes by, the swollen hemorrhoid, it irritates it. And there's a blood vessel waiting underneath. So once that blood gets out, it really can look like, and sometimes it is, quite a bit of blood. Yeah, and that's and why it's, it's so and frightening. it's very red, and it, as I said, it can be quite scary. Yes. Uh, pregnancy, do you want to say a couple words about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. So there's more pressure. And so that puts pressure both on the internal and the external for the most part after delivery, all of that resorbs and you come back to what you were beforehand, although sometimes the external hemorrhoidal tissue remains and that is what looks like extra skin on the outside. Yeah, the, having a fetus in there, if you think about it, fills up the, the pelvis, all the veins draining the legs and the rectal area, get press, pressure on them, plus women, their blood volume increases. Yes. So it's a, it's a, it's a multi-combinational thing that really puts them at great risk for hemorrhoids. How about uh, diet? What should you do about diet? What role does diet have in hemorrhoids? So keeping the stools soft and regular. So hard, you're straining to move it out. Not regular or constipated, again, you're straining. And the more straining there is, the more pressure there is, the more you can make these problems worse. So hydrating eating a lot of fiber, and sometimes in times of extreme constipation, even adding a stool softener or an occasional laxative just to keep things moving. I was gonna ask about the stool softeners because I know for uh, people in my family that the stool softener plus the fiber was the final solution to, actually it was calcium induced uh, constipation ah. from taking for osteopenia too low bone mass. But yeah, what about the stool softener? They're available over the decusate sodium. It's available over the counter. Correct. Although you want to read the label clearly or even ask your pharmacist because if you choose a laxative, then you can actually just be promoting more movement, which can make hemorrhoids worse. So yeah. you just want to find that happy medium, which is different for everybody. But stool softeners are a good a good. I think adjunct. that's, that's a, a really important point. I, people may think of laxatives all in one bag, but they're there's, maybe yeah, rather than me say it, why don't you talk about the different kinds of things that are out there from fiber on through uh, the, uh, some of the promotility agents. Sure, so uh, anything you can get over the counter as a promotility agent um, often says it right on the box, but there are some supplements that may or may not tell you that what is in it is actually 
promoting more movement, so a laxative. So something as simpler, simple as licorice uh, is a very s good stimulant. Um, Are stimulants as a whole to be avoided? So it depends why you're using them. And so uh, interestingly, I perform colonoscopies and you can actually tell the mucosa or the lining of the colon as we're looking through of the colon of a person who's been using a lot of laxatives because it actually changes color. Yeah, they, I know there's an entity, because it melanosis coli. That's that, exactly That it. you see in patients who have chronic laxative abuse. Yes, and so abuse You don't is, get that with fiber. Correct, and abuse is something that, it, you know, are you doing it to constantly clean yourself? Are you doing it because there's a problem? There's really a mechanical problem that you should be addressing, not just overlooking it and trying to treat it with a laxative. So the, one of the so two of the things that would be important to prevent hemorrhoidal disease, as you said, with hydration and maintaining a soft, regular bowel movement, and trying to get off your bum. And so, if you have the opportunity to change positions, um, people have introduced standing desks. So Just people ask who about are that. yep, people I've written prescriptions for them. Uh, people who are sitting for a long period of time can't change position and get up and Does go to the bathroom. Does insurance cover them if you write a prescription? For no, them? but your work. Place may. <laughs> okay, that's, I just wondered whether they've become that advanced. Yeah. So you actually prescribe standing. I have. I have prescribed standing, and I think it's a it's a brilliant move because, first of all, it engages you. You don't get the daytime tired feeling. You're getting up. You're changing position, but it's really good for the pressure on the bottom. Uh, we even uh, ask folks if they can balance on one of the exercise balls. That's a really good way to in maintain core they can roll forward and keep off of their backside. Those, that's for my folks who by no means can get a standing desk or however it works. And what, once you, well, you mentioned two things. You've mentioned the painful hemorrhoid and the bleeding hemorrhoid. Uh, when should people seek medical attention and what, sh what do you do? So, uh, you know your own body. And so oftentimes you can say, my digestion just isn't what it used to be. I'm eating the same things, but I'm feeling that either they're not passing easily or they're passing too easily. So I'm, now I'm having a lot of loose stools. point out, as we get older, I think our digestion does get more sluggish. And, and our colon gets more sluggish. And it's true. And then uh, we also introduce some foods that never used to bother us. Lactose is number one, can start to bother you as, as we mature. Yeah, that's an important point. If you kids are less often lactose intolerant than adults, so, and, and that you often get diarrhea from, right? Correct, correct. And then it's, it's difficult because you know what you put into your own food. That's another one of my, my recommendations to my patients is, if there's any question, prepare it yourself because you just don't know what else is in food that you buy either packaged or someone else prepares. You prepare your own food, you know the amount of milk and fiber mm -hmm. and everything else that goes into it. So, so you, you find out you have hemorrhoids, you have a bleeding hemorrhoid, it stops, you're fine. Should you do something, do, as a surgeon, do you take them away? Do you resect them surgically? Uh, someone, a woman who's had a pregnancy and has some external hemorrhoids that aren't bothering her. Right. How do you handle that? So, uh, internal hemorrhoids, as we talked about, painless rectal bleeding, if everything we do with maintaining bowel movements and hydrating, all the things we just talked about, if they don't work, we have things we can do. We can surgically remove them, but there are many things we can do just in the office with infrared laser treatment, rubber banding um, that actually goes around the hemorrhoid itself and cuts off the blood supply and then it dies and you just poop it out. Mm -hmm. um, we can also inject them with a scler sclerosant therapy. It actually causes the scar down. Correct. Uh, that's the internal hemorrhoids. External hemorrhoids, only way to get rid of them is surgery. And I always say, and it's never a threat to my patients, but it's some of the most painful surgery I do. And so depending on why you want them removed, are they difficult to clean because there's so much extra skin there and you're just constantly feeling like there's leakage and soilage, that's a reason to have an external hemorrhoid removed. Or is there one that just keeps thrombosing? It gets better on its own, but then it comes back. That's a good reason to have it removed and can, as well. You can't sclerose or uh, 
ban the external hemorrhoids? No, in fact, because anything that's covered with skin has exquisite sensation. So if we were to put a rubber band or something tight on that, we'd have to peel you off the ceiling and then take you down to the OR to take the rest of the hemorrhoid off. So externals, you just can't do anything in the office besides the thrombos. So you've given me new respect for external hemorrhoids. It's so true. <laughs> <laughs> try to, so you try to avoid that. Oh, if, if you've had one and you know what it's, what it's like, you do everything you can to avoid it. We haven't had a chance to talk about the Tukas commercials, but unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. <laughs> Please share your questions and comments by calling Community Relations at New Vance Health. The number is 203-852-2250. We'd love to hear from you. I'd also like to thank my guest, Dr. Kirsten Pritchard, for joining me on Health Talk today, and thank you for watching Health Talk. <laughs>